Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the sad news of the final ISSS talk in the Strauss Center's Distinguished Lecture Series this year. It is good to see all of you here. Is it sad that I'm giving it, or that is the final? Oh, you stole my line. So, all right, okay, well, I guess I can't introduce this guy. He's, you know, that. Um, uh, the sad news is that it's the last talk, but the good news is that it's from uh, a most worthy candidate, Professor Peter Fever. Um, I assume most of you saw Peter's bio on the announcements, so I won't go into it at, uh, at great length, but suffice it to say he's a professor of political science and public policy at Duke University. Uh, he runs the American Grand Strategy Program at Duke. Uh, he is the director of the Triangle Institute for Security Studies, uh, and he has a very distinguished academic pedigree. That alone would make him a worthy candidate to speak here and uh, give him much wisdom. But in addition to that, he also has a distinguished policy background, including several years of service on the National Security Council in both the Clinton administration and the Bush 43 administration. And he'll be drawing on some of those reflections during that time as well. Uh, and I might say that he actually had a very, uh, I think, commendable record, uh, particularly in the Bush administration, where he made nary a single mistake in policy except for one. And that was hiring me. Um, and uh, so we became good friends working alongside each other at the NSC. Uh, Peter spent the next couple of years regretting that, but um, as a sign of his grace, he still agreed to come out here and give this talk. So with that, Peter, we'll turn it over to you. You'll, um, uh, Peter will make his remarks, and then after that, we'll have uh, some minutes for Q&A. So. Well, thank you. To throw out the talk and just tell Will Imboden's stories because uh, please do yeah <laughs> but uh, you you might feel the same way after I give the talk because I'm, I'm I'm bringing coals to Newcastle I am coming to uh, one of the great centers in the world for studying American grand strategy uh, the, and you have some of the best scholars right here and I'm going to do three preemptive strikes I'm going to make three points. Uh, that uh, each one of them has disagreed with violently at some point, in, in, and perhaps it'll be in about 20 minutes, so that they'll disagree violently again. So I'm probably wrong on all three of these points, uh, and they will give lectures over the next couple of weeks to explain why I'm wrong. But I hope that I will persuade enough of you uh, to carry on the flame. And the three points I'm going to make are this. The first is that we've had a coherent grand strategy uh, ever since the end of the Cold War. And it's been a pretty successful one, as grand strategies go. Uh, the second is that if you want to evaluate President Bush's uh, grand strategy choices, you need to do serious counterfactual analysis. And that's a dirty word to historians, counterfactual analysis. And the third point is that when you do the counterfactual analysis, of Bush's uh, grand strategy choices. You come away with the sense that it was a series of 55-45 decisions, as opposed to a series of 90-10 decisions. 55-45 meaning closer calls about whether it was wise or not, rather than a series of obvious <coughs> wise decisions and obvious boneheaded ones. So if you were to round up any uh, garden variety person toiling in this field of grand strategy, and by the way, there's plenty of us now, the, 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 it's the flavor of the month uh, in the broader strategic studies community, so there's a lot of us jumping in. If you get any one of them, they would disagree with me on each one of those three points. Uh, they'd be wrong, uh, but they would disagree with me uh, very persuasively. So I'm an iconoclast on these things, uh, but, but uh, that's, uh, that's what you're paying for. At least that's what I hope you're paying for. I, I haven't checked the, uh, the forms that I got. So, how, how can I make this? How, how can I make this point? Well, the first one is that uh, we've had a coherent grand strategy since the end of the Cold War. Grand strategy refers to the theory of the case that policymakers use to explain to themselves and to the rest of the world how they're going to meet the challenges of the day, and in the American case, how to meet the challenges of the day while avoiding the last war. Grand strategist in the American setting has always been focused on avoiding the last war. So the grand strategy of containment was a way of meeting the Soviet challenge without having another World War II 
a, a global hot war across where we were fighting in multiple theaters against uh, fascism and imperialism. <coughs> and, and containment appeared to be a, a way of meeting the Soviet challenge without having that uh, hot war. And the post-Cold War grand strategy has been about meeting the challenges and opportunities that presented themselves in the, with the end of the Cold War without having another Cold War, avoiding a hostile peer rival who could challenge the United States across the globe. That was what had happened in the Soviet Union, and the, and the U.S. was very grateful to have come out of that relatively unscathed, uh, and to be sitting as the single superpower without a hostile peer rival. And the preeminent goal of American grand strategy was to preserve that as long as possible and to make that status quo even more robust. And the way they did that was with a four-pillared grand strategy. The first pillar of the grand strategy was a velvet-covered iron fist. The iron fist maintaining defense spending far in excess of what was needed for the near-term threats. So propping up defense spending beyond what it would have needed to meet sort of the threats of 1990 with the Soviet Union collapsing, warps on pack gone. And if you needed this size military back then, and you did a straight line extrapolation back when the Soviet Union was, <coughs> was around and the Warsaw Pact was around, then of course you must only need this much now that it's gone. And the U.S. strategists were sitting there already, they're kicking the table there so <laughs> The U.S. grand strategists said, no, we're going to keep it up here. We're going to keep it higher than it might need to be for the short term so as to dissuade would be rivals from becoming peers in a military sense. That is, dissuade rivals from being so close to us militarily that if they just raced a little faster they could catch up. Why? Because the distance was so great they wouldn't try. Uh, and so <coughs> at the height of the Reagan buildup, military buildup, U.S. was spending, what, roughly 26 percent of global defense uh, spending was done by the United States. Ten years into the end of the Cold War, Soviet Union long gone, U.S. is spending close to 50% of global defense spending. That's if you throw in the war on terror and throw in the Iraq war. So the, the height of the Bush buildup. <clears throat> now, partly that's because, not partly, that's primarily because everyone else's defense spending went down. But it's also because U.S. defense spending didn't go down nearly as much as they did, and then with the war on terror, it was a plus up. So, an iron fist. But wrapped around that iron fist was a velvet glove of accommodating would-be rivals so they would not be hostile. Accommodating near peers giving them more of an equity stake in the existing world order in the distribution of goodies so that they would buy into the existing world order rather than challenge it. And the U.S. and the grand strategists were worried that there would be folks who would become hostile peers to the United States. That the end of the Soviet Union would, the, sorry, the passing of the Soviet Union would be replaced by others who would be, who take their place. Now, the great historian sitting in the front row can tell us who it was in 1989 that we were worried about, but if you're not a historian and you didn't live through it, it's hard to, it's hard to make sense of it because it was Japan. Just down the road, George Friedman founded Stratford and made a lot of money. Might be the name, I don't know, but made a lot of money. <laughs> And his book was The Coming War with Japan. And the joke was the Cold War's over and Japan just won. That Japan had free ridden off the U.S. Uh, defense, and now the U.S. has exhausted itself, so the Union's gone. Japan will be 
the next uh, <coughs> event that would would uh, would challenge the U.S. interests around the world. That's not how it worked out for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is the U.S. sought to accommodate Japan and, in fact, appease Japan on a number of issues. Now, in the first Clinton administration, it wasn't. The trade wars between uh, U.S. and Japan were quite severe in the first Clinton administration. The second Clinton administration, under the Nye Initiative, they said, this is crazy, we've got to get our relations with Japan back on order, and they accommodated Japan's interests on a number of trade issues. They all did the same with Europe. And uh, another uh, prominent strategist, uh, John Mearsheimer, wrote a book, I'm uh, sorry, wrote an article talking about how the coming rivalry in Europe would be very disruptive and produce a lot of problems for America. Uh, and this was a reasonable concern at the time. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, and the Europeans managed to avoid it. There was a lot of accommodation, uh, again, some trade accommodation. Of course, we did it with Russia giving Russia a seat at the G8 when Russian power wouldn't justify that, but it's a way of preserving their equity position in the international system. And where it's most explicit, the Velvet Glove is with China. In fact, the term for our China policy in the, under the Bush administration was responsible stakeholder. We wanted China to become a responsible, meaning they would see the world our way, stakeholder, meaning that they would see they themselves as having the same vested interest in the status quo and not disrupt it. And in olden days, this would have been called an appeasement position, but we had to make a couple concessions to Chinese concerns on a number of issues. But it was very much an accommodation to uh, be the velvet glove around an iron fist that was otherwise directed at preserving U.S. grandmothers. So that was the first pillar. I won't take as long on the other three pillars, uh, but the other three pillars. Pillar two is making the world as much like us politically, spreading democracy and American approach to human rights. The way the Bush administration described it was human liberty protected by democratic institutions. The theory being the more states are like us politically, the more they will like us politically. The more they will think like us, the more they will have the same vested interest in the international order. The pillar three is spread economic, make the world as much like us economically through the Washington consensus, globalization and uh, open markets. And pillars two and three were thought to be re mutually reinforcing, that democracies that were economically free would <coughs> last longer, and economic, uh, states pursuing <coughs> economic freedom that were politically free would last longer, and if you try to do one without the other, <coughs> it, would, it would stunt. Uh, and the idea was, if you make the world more like us politically, economically, that will be better for the world, but that will be very much better for the United States, and it will preserve this, this existing system. Uh, and the fourth <coughs> pillar was saying, what's the near-term threat that could disrupt the global uh, order, it's the spread of weapons of mass destruction to rogue states. If the long-term threat is the rise of a hostile peer rival that would challenge U.S. globally, the near-term threat was WMD in the hands of rogue actors. And so our most urgent near-term national security threat uh, or challenge <coughs> was confronting proliferation of WMD to rogue state actors. Those four pillars are, were a, pursued unevenly, but fairly systematically by the Bush administration, by the Clinton administration. In fact, Clinton's national security strategy was called the strategy of enlargement and engagement, explicitly, very explicitly describing the pillars two and three. And it's thick with discussion of proliferation as a concern. Uh, and President Bush came into office campaigning, claiming that he was going to re-establish a commitment to Pillar 1, that he thought Pillar 1 had, had wavered a little bit under the Clinton administration. He also criticized the Clinton administration for trying to elevate a fifth pillar called uh, uh, humanitarian intervention to prevent ethnic conflict, that state failure, Clinton argued, was a... Uh, 
a national security challenge as important as proliferation of WMD, and so thus required uh, U.S. military engagement. And Bush rejected or criticized that uh, in, when he was campaigning. Uh, and that fifth pillar never really reached the same level of consensus that uh, WMD is. So that's why I don't include it as one of the consensus core grand strategy pillars. But those four were the legacy grand strategy that Bush inherited. And Bush largely continued. Now, you'll say, where was this articulated in, those, in that four pillar chart? And I'll tell you, Jeremy, it's not articulated in those four pillars exactly. But if you read, as you have, the DPG, the Defense Planning Guidance of 1992, you get the gist of that. If you read the 1994 National Security Strategy, I think it's there. Uh, it's certainly there in the 2002 2006. NSS, and by the way, and this is not for today's talk, but President Obama has largely continued it. So that's the, that, that grand strategy was, has largely continued to this day until 9-11. And at 9-11, the President Bush had a fateful grand strategy choice. I'm going to talk about that in the, the last third of the, the talk. But to evaluate it, I'm going to introduce the idea of a counterfactual. A counterfactual is something that's not true. That's sort of how the way historians describe it. But that, <laughs> the, uh, and that, that's, that's, yeah, that's technically precisely true, uh, correct definition. But that's not how I'm using it. A counterfactual is something that might have happened if things had gone in a different way. And historians dislike counterfactuals. In fact, I, one of my dearest friends, uh, you know, it uses it like it's an epithet, you know, like, a, like, like it's a slur. You know, if, you, if you introduce a thing, we'll say, well, that's a counterfactual, as if that, by nature of it, discredits it. Uh, and I think that's because there's a side, a subsection of Borders books, or maybe not Borders anymore, Barnes & Noble, wherever it is, where it's like the counterfactual history section, and these are books about what if the South had won the Cold War, you know, or what if... Civil War. The Civil War. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now that would That's be the counterfactual. counterfactual. <laughs> That's what they call counterfactual. And isn't there, wasn't like a... Uh, wasn't there a TV series with Germany winning, you know, yeah. and what's America Absolutely. like with Germany winning World War II? Anyway, anyway. And I mean that it makes maybe good for a good TV, but it's so problematic. And 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 some counterfactuals are crazy. You know, what if Eleanor Roosevelt could fly? Well, how would that have changed World War II? So there is a bad element of counterfactual. But my argument to you, my second argument to you is, you can't do policy analysis without doing counterfactuals. You can't evaluate policy without doing counterfactuals. Because if you want to tell me that that policy was boneheaded and led to bad outcomes, then you are telling me that a different policy would have led to different outcomes, better outcomes. Do you see what I'm saying? If you want to say that it was a mistake to administer that surgery because the patient died after you did that surgery, you are making a counterfactual claim that if you had not done that surgery, the patient wouldn't have died. And maybe that's true. But in order to make that case, you have to do the counterfactual analysis of running the experiment, the running the historical analysis, but changing that policy, looking at plausible alternatives. And so you have to do counterfactual analysis. And I submit that everyone who talks about the Bush administration's choices talks about how dumb they were or now that I'm in Texas, there might be some here who say how smart they were. Uh, they are doing counterfactual analysis, and they are just not doing it systematically. So, a friend of mine, Steve Biddle, and I uh, have, are writing a book. Maybe we're writing a we've written a book chapter, and if we can get along long enough to write the whole book, we're going to write a whole book, doing a systematic analysis of a series of. Bush decisions on grand strategy and doing the counterfactual analysis of what if he had made a different choice. And so for the last little bit here, I want to look at two of his faithful choices. 
And the first fateful choice <coughs> is the whole reason why I had to do all the setup of grand of the four pillars of grand strategy was how should I think about terrorism? How should I, President Bush, think about terrorism? Is this does this change everything? Or does this change nothing much? That was the grand strategy question that President Bush had to make. And the choice that he made was to elevate terrorism as a fifth co-equal pillar with all of the other pillars, but not to downgrade any of the other four pillars. So he said, Terrorism now is a near-term urgent threat that could disrupt the global order, as scary as WMD in the hands of rogue state actors, but not so important that it, all the other four can be slighted. In <coughs> fact, he said, the intersection of four and five, WMD in the hands of rogue state actors, in cahoots with militant Islamist networks of, uh, sorry, networks of militant Islamist terrorists, that, if four and five ever got together, that would be the worst of all. So we have to be equally vigilant in pursuing terrorism, pillar five, and pursuing WMD in the hands of roadstead actors, pillar four. And, by the way, pillars two and three are an important part of our answer to five. So the freedom agenda argument of how are we going to defeat the ideology of the terrorists, well, you use pillars two and three. So that revives pillars two and three, and at the same time, and this is crucial, they're going to continue all of the transformational investments in defense that were part of pillar one, of maintaining defense spending, the, the velvet-covered iron fist. We're going to do it all. That was the strategic choice that he made, and he could have made different choices. And let me just, let's consider two counterfactuals. What if, instead of elevating terrorism to a co-equal, he had said, we're going to treat it as a law enforcement problem. Mm -hmm. That's how it had been up until now. For the most part, President Clinton had viewed terrorism as, a, as primarily a concern for law enforcement and intelligence. There's some role for the military, but but it was primarily law enforcement and intelligence, and we're not going to view it through the military lens. There were reasonable, plausible voices suggesting that we do this at the time, the most famous of which is a guy named Michael Howard, the granddaddy of grand strategists, who gave a speech within weeks of 9-11 making this argument. So it's not, a, it's not Eleanor Roosevelt could fly kind of counterfactual. There was a plausible argument. What would have been the consequences of that choice. Well, Steve and I in our paper, which I, is you know, available for you all to read, so anything that's unpersuasive here, trust me, it's totally persuasive in the paper. Um, we say that would have been cheaper. That would have saved some money because there's aspects of the war on terror that were, were costly. But the damage to Al-Qaeda would have been substantially less that part of the reason why Al-Qaeda, 10 years into this, now 11 years into this, is in its weakened state is because they did serious damage to their cause in waging the Iraq war. What, listen to what I said. They, Al-Qaeda, did serious damage to their cause in waging the Iraq war. Now we can argue whether we did damage to our side in waging the Iraq war, but it's inarguable that Iraq was a strategic disaster for Al-Qaeda. It siphoned off attacks against the U.S. homeland, which is what Al-Qaeda was trying to do. It consumed large numbers of their foot soldiers, but more consequentially, it was a mortal blow to their strategic narrative. Because in Iraq, their affiliate, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, killed so many Muslims, so many Shia, and it got so bad that the number two 
al-Qaeda leader, sent a letter to the al-Qaeda and Iraq leader, so Zawahiri sent a letter to Zarqawi, in which he said, dude, you are killing too many Muslims. You are destroying our reputation as a defender of the Muslim faith because you are killing so many Muslims. We intercepted this letter. It's called the ZZ letter. And I remember the discussions about what should we do with this letter. And, and to me, that it was obvious we should publicize this. This is, this is proof that, that they were losing their strategic uh, um, uh, progress or their, their strategic direction, they, Al-Qaeda. And, and when they had a foothold, AQI, had a foothold in Anbar province, <laughs> and were finally able to establish a territory within the heartland of where they sought to build the Ummah. So they had tried it in Afghanistan, but that's on the periphery. The Ummah, the heartland was to be on the Arabian Peninsula, and in, I'm uh, sorry, in, in, in Arabia, Greater Arabia, and there in Anbar, they have their uh, um, territorial control, and the tribes reject, reject it. The Ar Arab and the Muslim people themselves reject it. And so it was a disaster for Al-Qaeda. It, it was also hugely costly for the United States. So under this counterfactual, you would have saved some cost, significant cost, perhaps, and you would have left Al-Qaeda stronger than it is today. Netting out, we argue, not an obvious 90-10 decision, but a, a tougher call. What about the other counterfactual of making terrorism the number one pillar, but reducing the other pillars and just focusing on terror, counterterrorism heavy, and reducing the others? Again, you'd save a lot of money. A lot of the defense build up, uh, the defense expenditures were not directly related to the war on terror. So you could have re saved a lot of money. But to the extent that Pillar 1 has positioned us well for the long run, with particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, you would have ended up in a slightly worse position strategically vis-a-vis -vis China, we are. So, could you improve our position? You could change the balance sheet a little bit. But you would not have, it would not have been a decision of a 90-10 where you would have all the benefits that we've got from against Al-Qaeda and none of the costs. You would have had to give up some of the benefits in order to reduce some of the costs. That's the first strategic uh, decision president made. The second strategic decision the president made was invading Afghanistan, but with a light footprint, coin, counterinsurgency orientation. And so here, the consequences of this was a fight that was still going on 10 years into it. So a fight that was not uh, decisive in a 10-year window, but enough to keep the Taliban from regaining control. And so the question was, and there's been much second-guessing, shouldn't we have invaded Afghanistan in a different way? Maybe we should have done CT light and not CT coin light. So CT light would be what Biden, Vice President Biden, has advocated uh, today. That is maintaining an exceptionally light footprint, not focusing on coin, which is hearts and minds, counterinsurgency throughout, trying to stay, build up a, a stable governance uh, structure in Afghanistan, but just doing <coughs> the drone strikes, the special forces strikes, just doing counterterrorism missions. What would have been the consequences of that? Well, you would have saved some money because there was a significant outlay of nation-building efforts in the coin side of it. 
But, we argue, you would have faced tremendous escalation dynamics because this would not have been enough, we argue, to defeat al-Qaeda and not enough to prevent the Taliban from resurging when they did uh, in 2006. So you might have said, well, w w and you certainly wouldn't have had a stronger Afghan government to hand over the thing, the thing to. So we would be, in strategic terms, about where we are on all the negatives in Afghanistan and not much further ahead on the positives. And you would have faced severe escalation dynamics of people saying, this is not working, you got to do more, you got to do more. Do you remember in Libya, just last year, when uh, for about five months, the U.S. was saying, we're going to do this hands-off light. And as that situation was getting worse and worse and progress wasn't uh, coming, the pressure on the administration to escalate, to intervene, in order to get a decisive outcome in Libya became greater and greater. And as a matter of fact, the administration did change from hands-off to a little more hands-on at the very end with a crescendo of airstrikes, and then, then, of course, they got Gaddafi and it was over. But our argument is that escalation pressure would have been even greater in, on the administration if they had done the CT only. Uh, and so we don't think it would have been significantly improving our position. The other counterfactual is going the other way, going even heavy. So what it, part of our problem, arguably, is that we went in with too light of a footprint. So when we cornered bin Laden and his gang in the mountains of Tora Bora, there were inadequate troops to close off the escape routes. And so we used the same technique that we had used to corner him there to try to block him. The technique being cutting deals with other militias. And one of the deals that we covered with the militia said, you cover the back end. The militia said, got it, yes. And then they let him out the back end. And if we had had heavier forces, maybe it could have been US Rangers covering the back end. And we might have caught Bin Laden. We're, Steve and I, are not persuaded by this counterfactual because the time it would have taken to do go in heavy, you say we're not going to do the light coin, the innovative technique, we're going to use the existing war plan. Well, the existing war plan did call for several hundred thousand U.S. troops. It basically called for doing Desert Storm, again, the war in 1990-91, where we moved, I think it was the city of Houston, the equivalent in terms of material to the Gulf. The war plan called for doing that in Afghanistan, which is even harder to get to. Uh, it would have taken much longer. In fact, the war plan was so infeasible that the commander, when he presented it to the President Bush, says, look, I know this is the one on the, on the shelf. We're not going to do this. This would take way too long. It would have taken six to months to a year before the U.S. could have invaded Afghanistan under those terms. Under that slow motion invasion, there's no chance we would have caught Bin Laden in Tora Bora. The reason we caught him in Tora Bora, or had the chance to catch him in Tora Bora, was that the Taliban fell so much faster than anyone expected. And they fell so much faster because we were in Afghanistan so much faster than anyone expected. In other words, that opportunity was only made available because of the peculiar timing that was available to us by the strategic option we pick. And so we would argue instead we'd be in a long, expensive, grinding war in Afghanistan. Sound familiar? Only we'd be there in 01, 02, 03, and the occupation narrative that has caused problems, that is, the notion that we are the infidel invading this territory and thus discrediting the Afghan government that we're trying to build up would have kicked in that much sooner. And so our argument is we can see some benefits, but probably would not have produced a materially better strategy. So does that mean that Bush got it exactly right in each of these choices? No. We can see how on margins, if you, with perfect hindsight, you might be able to improve things 
on the margins, but it's not a 90-10 change, we would argue. It's a closer to a 55-45 change. That's <coughs> our story thus far. You notice we've stopped. We haven't had time yet to write the next chapter, which is the Iraq invasion of Iraq. And I know someone will ask me about that in the Q&A, so we can talk about that. Maybe that one, maybe we'll say that's more of a 70-30. I don't know. We'll have to, as we think through the counterfactual. Uh, I'm sure when we get to the surge chapter, that, that might feel more like a 70-30 as well than a 55-45. I don't know. Steve and I are still uh, working on it. But we're sure that if you're going to do this kind of hindsight critique, you also have to do it in tandem with the serious counterfactual. And let me leave you then with this one debate that Steve and I have not resolved. There are two ways that you can end up in a 55-45 world. And the story that I have emphasized thus far is the equifinality story. That means multiple routes ending up in the same place. This, you, you try this one, but you're going to end up back here. You try this path, but you'll end up back here. Equifinality means no matter which way you go, the structure of the system is driving towards an outcome. But there's another way that you could arrive at the 55-45, and that is through privilege and contingency. The idea that for want of a nail, the, the kingdom is lost. If only the rangers had been a little bit further up the valley. If only, and just contingency after contingency, mis uh, uh, bad luck after bad luck, or good luck after good luck, in the case of almost uh, catching him. And, and that thus, an analysis drives to 55-45 because of the luck factor, the contingency of history, uh, rather than through the structural equifinality. And Steve and I disagree on this. I tend to think contingency plays a bigger role. He tends to think equifinality plays a bigger role. Uh, he's persuaded me enough on, our, on the two that we've already done, so I present the story the way I did. But when we get to later ones, I wonder if contingency isn't going to play a bigger role in our analysis. Uh, but either way, <coughs> as we evaluate the, the strategic choices, I encourage you to think it through in the way that I did. And if I'm wrong, don't throw out the method, improve it and refine it. And why don't I give you a chance to do that right now in the Q&A. Uh, Peter, we'll let you self-moderate, so. Self-immolate, did you Yeah, say? that's right, yeah, that's right, so anyway. This is not the first time I've raised my hand. Now. Yes, you, you look familiar. Uh, Duke, you were, I ever my saw introduction it. to international relations teacher in 2004. Wow. So, and here I am. Am I contradicting everything I said back then? You I know, you not. basically tell me what realism meant. So, well, I hope I did more than that, but I'll. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to reference my notes. Um, but I want to take the counterfactual back away into yep. history and say, what if the post-Cold War strategy had been different. And yes. the question really is, to what extent did Pillars 1, 2, and 3, which are very ideological, and perhaps could be accused of unnecessary military buildup, such to become a viewed as an um, uh, aggressor, mm -hmm. um, lead to the fundamental anti-Americanism that brought us to 9-11? OK, so it would, it, the, the pillar that got us in trouble quote unquote, with um, uh, Al-Qaeda wasn't one, two, and three, it was number four, right? It was the need to contain Iraq. And why did we need to contain Iraq? Because we believe, we discovered in, after uh, Desert Storm that their WMG programs were much further advanced than we had expected, a massive intelligence failure. Uh, not as massive as the, the one that came afterwards, but nevertheless, they were a lot closer than we thought to a nuclear program. And so we uh, were going to contain Iraq, and containing Iraq involved uh, an a air uh, cover over the northern and southern parts, and that involved 
air bases in Saudi Arabia, and that involved U.S. troops on Saudi soil. Now you get to a actual grievance that Al Qaeda picked. They said one of, in fact, Al Qaeda, Bin Laden at one point went to the Saudi king. This is after Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, and said, "I and my mujahideen will defend the kingdom in case uh, Saddam Hussein comes all the way to Saudi Arabia. Uh, so allow me, Bin Laden, to defend. Don't use the United States because they're infidels." The Saudis thought about it. I said, like you guys, we thought you were great over there in Afghanistan, but we're gonna, we want the Americans standing between us and, and Saddam Hussein. The Americans standing between them and Saddam Hussein meant standing on, on Saudi soil. Uh, and that was a grievance. That's not the only grievance they had, but that was the one that they mentioned first ahead of grievances like uh, support for Israel and others. They mentioned also the sanctions policy, which was part of the, the WMD one. So, that's, that's the one that, that produced grievances that Al-Qaeda was able to manipulate. So you're saying, now what if we had ignored that and just allowed <coughs> proliferation to continue unreservedly? I would argue that would produce a, a world of considerable, that, that we'd be worried about. There's a reason why we worry about WMD in the hands of, of of rogue states. And there's a re because there's a reason the rogue state actors want those WMDs. It's not merely to achieve mutual assured destruction and the stability of the Cold War, but it's also to provide regime guarantors and a shield behind which they can pursue their regional ambitions. And so I, I think that that world would have been um, a messy world. But it's a great question. I need to think about it some more. Yeah. So I, I think, as always, Peter, this was a great presentation. I, fundamentally I, wrong, but great. <laughs> <laughs> More than fundamentally wrong. <laughs> no, I mean, as, as always, you bring a very thoughtful perspective, and, and also I think uh, I, I deeply respect your ability to uh, re-examine questions you've already thought a lot about. It's, it's the rare scholar who does that, so you deserve a lot of praise for that. Um, and and I, I think many of us in the room strongly support the use of counterfactuals. You're right, there tends to be a historical poo-pooing of it, but, but actually I think good historians always do counterfactual analysis. And my criticism would be that I don't think you've really done that. I think uh, you've done the veneer of that. Okay. Which is to say you've, you've posited a few different decisions that could have been taken, and you've actually bought into the equifinality, which is to say all roads would lead to Rome anyway, which is actually the sort of thing that often happens when you get in the weeds. Because you realize how hard the decisions are, and you realize how hard it is to think outside of the outcomes. Right? This is exactly the problem Lyndon Johnson had in Vietnam. He saw everything that was happening before him, anticipated all the problems, but couldn't think his way out of it. Right. Uh, and lamented that all the way through. Um, so it would seem to me, if you were to do counterfactual analysis, you'd have to take on the relatively large range of options that were available at key moments, beyond the range you've laid out here and the contingent possible outcomes for which we don't know where things would have gone, better or worse. I'll just put a few out there, right? I mean, you said there was the, you posited that with regard to terrorism, the two options were law enforcement or putting terrorism way at the top. There's a lot in between. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that could have been done in between that would be strategically different, that would have had a whole series of outcomes. Give me an I'll give you, I, I have three I wrote down here, right? So, <laughs> just, just in case you ask you me. You have it in your hand, 56. <laughs> I bet I could come up with 56 of them. <laughs> so let's take, let's take uh, something that would have been more of an anti-Taliban, uh, forget even about bin Laden, but sort of work to build some kind of political stability in Afghanistan solution. That's a fusion of some law enforcement, but it's not just go after Bin Laden, it's actually get him out of there right. and try to build something, really put more effort into the bond process. But how himself. do you get, out, get him out of there without going after him? No, I mean, but let him, let him okay, escape. Go after him. Let, let him, him escape okay. Tora Bora, right? And then you build something. You want him to kill? You want him to catch After him? that happens, okay. right? I'm talking okay. late 2001. Right? You're doing Dove Zakheim's book. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, so that's one, that's yeah. one possibility, right? Mm -hmm. and, Do and James Dobbins also talks about that, right? Do right. Dobbins right. and James right. would be one route to go. Another option, yeah. right, which is to say, let's, uh, let's spend a little time, let's work with our allies, let's try to build a consensus on certain things we want to do. They're with us now in Afghanistan. Let's hold off. Maybe we do Iraq, maybe we don't. We hold off a little bit, 
Let's build more of an international consensus. Let's try more sanctions. Let's try all sorts of other things. I'm not positing that either of those two, or the third one I have here and others, would have necessarily worked better. I'm saying we don't know. And to actually do serious counterfactual analysis, you have to take a lot more time to run those out. Right. You have to do a book. And this is the first chapter. So I, I'm with you. Though both of those come after, right? So both of those come after the, the chronology that I gave you, right? And so let me take Dubs, so the better resource coin. Uh, in, I think there's something to that. And I think that probably, uh, I mean, I, Dub knows this better than I do, so I'm going to, to agree with him that better resourcing the, the investments in the uh, Afghan national government would have been better. I don't think, though, it would have dramatically uh, created stable governance in, in Afghanistan. Because the, the problem, the structural problems of Afga Afghanistan would have been the same. No cash uh, uh, export crop except for poppies. Uh, a government that is driven with tribal and a the intra Pashtun, not just the across, but within the Pashtun tribe problems, and that what what sunk Afghanistan, in my judgment, not sunk. What the the iceberg that Afghanistan hit was not the uh, inadequate resourcing of coin in 03, 04, 05, which is what when your story would kick in, but rather Musharraf's deals with the tribes in Pakistan in 2006, which was driven not by anything we did in Afghanistan, but rather by Musharraf's totally separate um, political fight with his Supreme Court Justice Chowdhury, which over corruption and, and stuff that had nothing to do with Afghanistan. And in order to stabilize his domestic situation, he makes he cuts this deal with the tribes in the, in the Fatah, uh, which at the time we all were saying, disaster, don't do it, it's not going to work, and Musharraf says, trust me, it's going to work. It was a disaster. And that's what allowed the re return of the Afghan Taliban. Yeah, we, I mean, we, so, could, we could argue on these. I guess my, my point is more... I should have done uh, it. No, well, yeah, but also, I mean, the, the policy process, to what extent uh, did policymakers take on real counterfactuals? But Lyndon Johnson didn't yeah. take on in Vietnam. Was he didn't take on beyond a very li very limited range of sense. When he was doing counterfactual analysis, yeah. he was doing something similar to what you did here, right. putting a couple of things on the table and saying, "These are going to get me the same place. I can't right. do these." Right. Well, okay. So I don't know how much they did of that that one. I know they did a more serious counterfactual on the one that you're describing. I mean, the fourth, the, yeah. your your next one, uh, and and ironically, it was a counter. It was driven by a counterfactual analysis of 9/11. The counterfactual analysis meaning, what if that had been a WMD attack? That was so much more painful than we had expected such a low-level, low-tech attack to have been. The, the warnings, as you know, from the, um, uh, the Hart Rudman Commission and others before 9-11 was the next attack, the big one, and it's going to be with radiological weapons or higher up. And boy, is that going to hurt. And then we have 9-11, which is at the low end, almost below the spectrum that they were looking at, and it hurts so much. And the damage uh, to our economy and to uh, our sense of security, et cetera, was so great. And the administ Bush administration did the counterfactual analysis. What if we had the next one, and it's, and it's a WMD one? And, by the way, we're now getting intelligence warnings that, that the next one will be. Because there was the anthrax, and there were a couple plausible uh, warnings, uh, and there was, the, when they took over the one site in Afghanistan, they found that the, that the Al-Qaeda was experimenting and trying to develop WMD, et cetera. So they ran that counterfactual analysis, and they said, we got to deal with this now. We can't wait. And we, they said, the time to do this is now while we have the momentum, rather than uh, after we've got Afghanistan exactly where we want it to be. 
we've got Afghanistan way ahead of where we thought it would be. You know, in the spring of 02, when they're making this decision, Afghanistan is further along than anyone ever thought Afghanistan war would be. And so they may have jumped the, the gun, perhaps, but they were but they were driven by this counterfactual analysis. I would disagree with you on the allies. I don't think the allies were with us by uh, January. I think they had already shown grave doubts about the wisdom of of this. Remember, Guantanamo is a no, is a November December kind of time frame, and that's introducing great friction. Um, well, that's another counterfactual. Yes. Yeah. yeah that, that's that's another one we could have done. Yeah. So, uh, so I. I think the administration uh, got where they got because of the because of their look. We're back. Let me last last answer this, and then I do want to let other people in. The genesis of this project actually was um, uh, Steve and my uh, uh, effort at the uh, Kennan sweepstakes. So you remember, right after the uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. There's their first round of Kennan sweepstakes. Everyone's trying to become the next Kennan to write the big grand strategy paper. Then, and none of us, no one gets it. And then after 9-11, it's round two. And everyone says, okay, now this really is, we need the great, you know, someone needs to write the X. Uh, and so Steve and I sit down and write this. You know, what is the, the, the range of choices? Uh, the, the problem was Steve was working for the Army, and he couldn't get, we couldn't get the paper released. If we had gotten the paper released, we'd look a lot smarter today than we did, than we actually do. Because... We were assessing, do you want to go the Iraq route? Do you want to go the continue uh, the law enforcement route? That was Steve's thing. Or do you want to go pursue al-Qaeda through ungoverned areas, which is the one I thought made more sense. Uh, but it was range of the, what were the strategic choices. Do you view this as a state-led problem, in which case Iraq is next? Do you view this as an ungoverned area problem, in which case Somalia or Yemen Philippines, whatever, is next. That, or do you view this as intelligence from this point forward, and so go back to law enforcement? And if only we had gotten that out, you know, but we didn't. So this is this paper is our attempt to re, you know, cannibalize that and get some publication out of it. Yeah. So, Peter, again, I agree with Jeremy. Terrific talk. Although I would say probably less controversial in the sense. Um, than you probably think. Um, first Rats. point. Okay, I'll try to say the first the point. Football stinks, and you too. Through your big three points, uh, uh, coherent grand strategy since the end of the Cold War, so a point of continuity. Uh, I think most historians, sort of serious historians, would say you know that, that that makes some sense. It's not necessarily controversial. And you talk to people in both. You were both in the Clinton Bush administration. You talked to a lot of people in the Clinton administration. They say you know a lot of what they did to were precedents and what we were thinking as well for continuity. Uh, doing counterfactuals, I agree with Jeremy. Well, you know, serious scholars think about right, the what if questions. It's about how you do it. And I think you know, we could have a long conversation that would bore everyone here about whether you're sort of doing I've it in a sophisticated that, yeah. manner or yeah. not. I think we'll put that inside. And 55 45 decisions, I mean, this, is, this is kind of standard fare for policy. It's what LBJ said. If it got to his desk, it's not an easy decision. It's what um, that fascinating little piece with, um, that Steve Wall had with uh, Kissinger, what he said about how all decisions are kind of 51, 49, and right. there's, you know, the sort of uh, <coughs> uh, epistemological skepticism isn't very helpful to policymakers. And so I don't think that's such a big deal. What is, at the end, you really sort of shocked me. You're, you and your co-author have fundamentally different ways of viewing the world. Um, you know, one of you sort of believes in the idea of structural factors and the other focuses on contingency. That's, that's a really big deal. And I started thinking to myself, all right, if I was doing the same analysis Peter's suggesting for the First World War, um, if I was the contingency guy, if I'm Peter Fever, I'm thinking, you know, the driver, we all know the story of Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand and his driver goes down the wrong road. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the assassin's sitting in a cafe, he's had a bad day of missing him all day, and he says, there's the Archduke, I'm going to go and I'm going to shoot him. And then you have World War I and everything that happens. And right. so that's an important way of thinking about things. If I'm a structural person, I say, you know, whether he got him that day or not doesn't really matter because the long term demographic pressures, the sort of great power politics, imperialism, all this stuff was blown up. If it hadn't happened, then it would have happened so long. These are, these are, in some ways, almost irreconcilable ways of viewing the way the world works. And so I guess what I'm interested in is um, how it is 
someone who believes in structure and someone who believes in contingency. It's essentially like getting Ken Waltz and Jeremy together and trying to decide to write something, right? I don't see how it happens. Yeah. So, 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 so I'm wondering if, if, if this, if this gap between you two is actually as real as sort of uh, you lay out. No, that's pretty it's not as real. And the answer is that uh, if we believe that the world was 100% equifinality, and the other person would believe the world was 100% contingency, then that's that's too diametrically opposed uh, worldview. But the, the the reality, as Will told his students, is whatever presented with the false dichotomy like that, always say, well, nuance and complexity says it's a mixture of the two. And so nuance and complexity says it's a mixture of the two. And, the, and where, Steve, where Steve and I... That's so helpful. Yes. <laughs> where we, I've, been, I've been using that for 20 years. I haven't <laughs> no, where, where Steve and I differ is how much of one versus how much of the other. But this and would, based on plan how you do the counterfactual. It, it does, it does. And, and it may be that on some decisions, this, the, that, that the structural factors are so strong that they are, uh, on, for those, that they'll drive the counterfactual analysis. But uh, that on others, the conditions are more permissive structurally, allowing for a wider range of possible outcomes and thus allowing for a uh, more of a role for contingency. And, I mean, and here I'm speculating because we haven't gotten to this point, but I could well imagine that some of the wider variance wisdom ones turn more on, so what, the ones where we say, well, that's closer to 70, 30, turn more on contingency. And the ones that go 55, 45 turn more on structure. So, a rack war. That, that, that there might have been more contingency if only phase four had been a slightly better, if only the fourth ID had come down from the north, et cetera, et cetera, but the surge. If, the, um, if they hadn't produced results by July, and so the Republicans make the long walk up Pennsylvania Avenue and tell Mr. President, it's time to, we're pulling the plug. If Luger, Domenici, Warner, and who was the fourth? There's one other one we're watching on uh, Ohio. Uh, four senators, if they had pulled the plug, the surge would have been over, you know. So there would there, the seventy thirty decisions might be turning on contingency. Maybe I don't know. I'm just speculating on that. But I think both are in play. And the question is, when you're doing the analysis, which one seems to be a heavier, uh, a heavier driver? Right, but you seem to be basing it on outcomes as opposed to sort of beforehand. One has kind of a philosophy of history, and people disagree about it. But I, what is your sort of one has to have a theory of causality and agency ahead of time, not not depending on the outcome of the case, but before you actually start the analysis. No, I think both are, my theory of history is that both can be in play. So I have to analyze the situation to figure out which one is, is more important than the other. I mean, it is also, it, it also, I'm just one of the other areas of disagreement Steve and I have, uh, which I did surface about three years ago, <coughs> is it gets my, fuel for your fire. How much leeway did pre did a politician have after 9-11 to say, we're always going to have terrorist attacks, just get used to it. Uh, we're going to reduce them so they won't be quite that bad, but they're going to keep <coughs> And malls will never be totally safe, uh, and you're just going to have to live with it in the same way that you learn to live with traffic accidents. Uh, could a president, could a politician have said that in the post 9-11 environment? My view is yes, he could have said that and he would have been thrown out uh, by the opposing party, whichever party it was, who put a president said, no, I'm going to use our military might to squash the terrorists who are doing this. So that Bush's position that this is a war and not law enforcement was driven by the American political system, not he was because he wanted to get reelected, but because any political leader in authority would have promised that. And if he had not, the, his opponent, out party opponents, would have um, outbid him on that. And so it was driven by that. And, and Steve seems to think, no, no, we should have been able to have more of that debate. So there, there's a case where I'm pushing for equifinality, and he's pushing more for 
I, I wouldn't interject normally. This is following up on Frank's I'm going to call on a student after this. Oh, no, okay. 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 Uh, Peter, I'm forever your student. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, the, this is more on the structural side than on the contingency side, but it seems that one thing that equifinality and contingency both have in common, as you and uh, Biddle are using them, is they're both kind of forward-looking in terms of after the choice is made, what are the subsequent uh, subsequent events that would uh, perhaps cause us to think this, this may or may not have, have, have worked out. But it seems like what might be going on here, if I as a historian can bastardize a political science term, is actually path dependence on steroids, both structurally and ideologically, in terms of when an American president takes over the presidency and looks at the tools he has, and this goes back to your pillars of grand strategy, well, he's got you know, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in an agencies dedicated to democracy promotion. So there's one. Uh, he's got hundreds of millions of dollars in agencies devoted to uh, promoting market capitalism. There's another one. He's got the biggest military budget in the world, and you know, et, et, cetera, et cetera, institutionally. Then you also have these ideological com commitments, and this is what you know. This was John Gaddis's argument about how does the United States react to surprise attacks. Well, preemption, unilaterally, hegemony, I mean, you know, we, uh, we've got this strong military, we go, we go on the offensive, that's just kind of in our national DNA. Uh, so this is more of a backwards looking, uh, you know, it's a way of asking, you know, uh, what, what are the path dependencies that a president inherits? It still comes out in the same way in terms of there's actually a pretty constricted range of choices. I think this is one of the things that President Obama's inherited. I don't know, who, Steve Russell did that? Right, yeah, no, I, I think that, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, this is the, one of the problems with counterfactual analysis is that you, you don't know all, you know very well the, the nth order of consequences of the path that you were on. But you, it's hard to do the nth order analysis, of, or to evaluate the nth order effects. Like first order effects is possible to do, second order starts to get a little dicier, nth order much, much harder to do. And so there's a hand-waving section in, in the paper, and I was physically waving my hand to be washed the table to see, where there's times where I say, well, I think we'd mostly be where we were, because I, I don't know for sure the end, end order effects, that there's a lot of path dependency, and you can't replay the history. So now President Obama comes in, he can't undo some of the choices that were done before. He has to uh, start his play not play, but start his, uh, his strategy, strategizing from where we are today, and that narrows his choices, so I agree. That's why there's been so much continuity, one of the reasons why. Yeah. So this has been a, across the board a fascinating discussion. I'm particularly interested in the, the counterfactual portion of this, and uh, what really the, the way that the Bush administration framed the counterfactual as, what if this had been a nuclear attack instead of what it was, and I'm, what I'm curious about is to what extent, if any, did that drive the decision to go to war in Iraq in 2003, looking and, at framing it that way? Yeah, the, the, there is a unfair criticism of the Bush administration that says the Bush administration sold the war on Iraq as if Iraq had attacked us on 9-11, because the Bush administration kept rhetorically linking 9-11 to Iraq and that this was some sort of subtle, subliminal way that the administration was trying to get people to think that Saddam Hussein had attacked us on 9-11, thus we're justified in attacking him. And unfortunately, polls show that a significant fraction of Americans believe that maybe Saddam Hussein had attacked us on 9-11. That's not the link that drove the analysis inside the administration. I wasn't there at the time, so. I had to reconstruct this afterwards, but I was very interested in this question. And as best as I can reconstruct it, it was a strategic risk calculus that changed on 9-11. The link for President Bush was the, his risk assessment of what risks he was willing to run. And on September 10th, he was willing to let some things be in his inbox on a slow, path to being dealt with. Slower path. And on 9 12 the day after, he said, those things which before I was willing to leave in the inbox or deal with them later when I have time to deal with, I am no longer willing to do that. So in January, February of 01, some in his administration said, we got to really enforce the issue on Iraq. And President Bush said, paraphrasing here, 
I, your critique of our Iraq policy makes a lot of sense, but we're going to not force the issue on Iraq. We've got other things to, to deal with. But you're right, the Iraq policy is broken. We've got to develop a, a better Iraq policy. Go develop a better Iraq policy. We're not going to force the issue on Iraq. After 9-11, he said we're going to force the issue on Iraq. What had changed was his assessment of how dangerous it was to allow things, problems, to remain in your inbox. And so when President Bush said, after 9-11, I've determined that we cannot sit idly by while threats gather. That, what he was saying was, 9-11 has changed my risk calculus. And so for him, the link was very much uh, a logical one that helped explain to him why he had to deal with Iraq sooner rather than later. And it was the WFD and the concern that Iraq might make an operational uh, um, alliance or a, a co uh, sort of a, a coalition of convenience, what's alliance of convenience that is, with Al Qaeda. Uh, by the way, we now have access to Saddam Hussein's intelligence files uh, and a lot of his own uh, ministry files. So we can go in and assess what his thinking was on these matters. And in particular, we have a lot of good documentation now from the inside, because they were meticulous record keepers uh, uh, on their relations with Al Qaeda. And do you know what we found? So if, if the Bush administration said, not, not Cheney's arguments, but if the, the modal Bush administration argument about the level of alliance claim was here, what do you think the documentation shows? Even less. No, I, here. That the, Kevin Wood has done a, a study of this, that there, not, there wasn't a link that led to 9-11. There's no smoking gun of that but multiple attempts by Al-Qaeda to make an operational outreach to Iraq, and by Iraq to make an operational outreach to Al-Qaeda, and they never could consummate it. And they didn't trust each other, one was secular, one was fundamentalist, and so they never got the uh, alliance, but they were probing it exactly as the administration was, was worried about. And what's interesting is those documents go largely ignored in the academy. And we, I was just at a conference where there's a whole panel devoted to studies uh, based on this, and they pointed out that they've done all these studies and no academic will cite their studies, even though it's based on important archival information. So it's an interesting thing. Um, I like what you're trying to do with the counterfactual analysis, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if you haven't made it too easy for yourself. I'm um, sure I have, yes. Well, I say that because you have kind of set it up in a way where basically there's a consensus over these pillars, and then the terrorism thing is added on. And so the presumption is you've kind of like, you know, there's a kind of domestic consensus. And I wonder if you re-ran it, where you assume that it's a, it's a Democrat in office, as opposed to a Republican, um, whether or not you might get slightly different results. Because, I mean, a Democrat would be thinking about the surplus at that time. Specific to, Gore, right? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. So we could probably assume, and most people do, that uh, whoever was in office would have done Afghanistan. Right. Would have prevented 9-11. Wouldn't have prevented 9-11. Would have invaded Afghanistan. And would have invaded Afghanistan. And would have invaded with the light footprint uh, there two weeks after. That's that was more of a Rumsfeldian uh, thing. But but I'll, I'll maybe you know for the sake of argument, I'll go right. to that. So let's yeah. so you go down that path part okay. of the way, and it turns out it's you know we do better than like as you said. You know, I mean everybody was surprised with the result. Right. Kind of a hot knife through. So water. then would Gore have done Iraq? Is that your question? Well, it's not exactly. I mean, yes, partly. Um, I mean, then I think for, for, for maybe a Democrat, there's the issue of uh, do you really like ratchet up defense 
I mean, you've kind of like treated defense spending as if it's flat over this 20-year period in a way, or you, you say it surges after 9-11, but in fact it comes way down on Clinton during the first term before it starts to go back right. up. So, but it does, does start to go up, back up under Clinton. I, I agree with you. It, it definitely goes back up. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the question here would be that a Democrat would be feeling more cross-pressure in terms of domestic priorities than I think a Republican at that moment felt. Okay. You can make an argument that for a Republican with a surplus like that, one of the challenges to figure out how to Pleaded. So a Democrat um, might have done something like, oh, I don't know, a Medicare counter -terrorism. plan B? Counterterrorism would have been the most obvious, or I mean, it's where Biden ends up, right. it seems to me. And that really was on the table earlier on. And well, so, or energy so, independence, right? Or energy independence. So, so the one question just concerns, you know, kind of like the starting conditions here and what it is that, you know, you're, you're kind of holding, I guess, what I would say to boil it down, is domestic politics kind of constant here, and I wonder about that. Yeah. Secondly... <laughs> I know you did. Right. Got a whole book that <laughs> And then secondly, you know, um, normally when we think about grand strategy, we also think about geography, right? right. And so, I mean, a, like a quick take on the three presidents since the end of the Cold War, Clinton, Europe, Bush, Middle East, Obama trying to get to Asia. Right, that there's a, a variation that way as well. And I just wonder, kind of, you know, it, it's, it's less constant in that sense. And, and to what extent that might okay. affect your analysis. So the, this, my, the, I have an easier answer to the second than the first. Yeah. Uh, I think that all three, three administrations have tried to get to Asia. <coughs> After all, the outreach to India started under Clinton. Right. And yet PNTR. Um, and it was, and, and of course PNTR in, in China. So I mean, they were, the Clinton was the one who, the butchers of Beijing, Clinton is the one who came in and made the accommodation on China because he's trying to get to, to Asia. He's stuck, quote unquote, stuck in Europe because that's where the killing is happening. But he's trying to get to Asia. He has a breakthrough with Vietnam, uh, and he has the the beginnings of the breakthrough with India. It takes what he's unwilling, the price he's unwilling to pay, what Bush is willing to pay, is the bitter pill on uh, nukes, the Civ nuke deal with India. Uh, but Bush is clearly trying to get to Asia, and by 2008, uh, we have the best bilateral relations with India, Japan, and China that the U.S. has ever had at the same time. It was thought you couldn't do as good with each of those as Bush did by 2008. So it was, he's trying to get to Asia too. The problem is the killing is happening in the Middle East. So I think, I think Obama, and by the way, Obama is still fighting and killing in the Middle East. Uh, and we might be about to invade uh, Syria. You know, I have to check the drudge, but uh, it could happen. Uh, and so it, he's finding that it's harder to pivot out of out of Asia. By the way, they, they, the Obama administration does not like the term pivot. Uh, that, that's uh, the bad. So if you want to stick the needle in them, that's why the shadow government using the word pivot. Uh, uh, they want to call it rebounds. But they're having trouble doing that because they still have wars in it. The first one, the, the, your first question is, is a very, is a, is a good one. We'll argue over many beers until the three hours of the night. I think there's less to it because I think 9-11 was so shocking it forced the, the Democrats to become hawks. Uh, and so you had, uh, and by the way, if it was <coughs> President Gore, he was the uber Iraq hawk of the Clinton administration, as you know. He was the one within the Clinton team that was most hawkish on Iraq. So it's not even clear to me that he wouldn't have read the uh, intel the same way that Bush did on Iraq. I, I don't know. That's a that's sketchier. But what is not sketchier is they would have they would have said after 9/11, okay, the coffers are open to defense. Whatever defense says they need, dollar wise, they're going to get. They they would have had to after, after a while. Uh, 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 and and. And as my 
sort of puckish intervention to you on is that Bush was also willing to spend the surplus on domestic priorities. Here I am in L LBJ, you know, school, and he's the one who did Medicare Plan B, right? So he, so he was willing to show that you know you could buy guns and butter at the same time, and so that's very much like what the 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 um, Democrats would have done. Where I thought you were going to go, and which is the harder counterfactual, is would they have done the tax cuts? Probably not. Probably not. And so that's, but that's domestic policy. I do national security. So, I, that, that, but that one is that that's, that's probably the more consequential, and that obviously has grand strategic consequences because of our fiscal situation today. Peter, we have time for one more question. So pick pick a. Uh, a is there a student who wants to ask a question? But if not, then I will. Okay. I'll, I'll let you, uh, you get the last question, sir. Yes. Okay, I'm not a student. That's okay, I know, I was looking. They're all sitting on their hands, so I don't... Oh, no, undergrad back. back there. Oh, yeah, undergrad, great, okay. Uh, I have a question in regards to the uh, first counterfactual. And you can come down afterwards, I'll stay here, you can ask. So the first counterfactual you present in regards to Al-Qaeda fighting the war in Iraq. Um, I guess that, that counterfactual assumes that we fight the war in Iraq, that we open up that particular theater, right, um, which allows Al-Qaeda to then fight it. Mm -hmm. um, do you run into problems when you're executing this methodology when you have to assume that other scenarios play out in the way that they did and then right. interject um, a series of alternative scenarios that may have played out from that particular view? Yes. This is, a li this is the limitation because if, why not allow, this was I think Jeremy's first question, there's, I can think of 64 other variations off of the one, why not allow all of them and now that we know how history played out, let's pick the ones that we think will have the best results and only, you know, re rerun the play, uh, but with everyone doing it exactly the way we'd want them to. So yeah, that's a, that's a limitation. Uh, and that's why what we've tried to do is look at big, single decisions that would have ramifications rather than looking at 60 sequential decisions single big decisions that have profound ramifications. But is there a specific, you know, ramification that you think I didn't cover that you would like me to speculate on? Embe embedded in your question. What, as you're saying, what if we had invaded Iraq and Al-Qaeda had not sent their uh, troops to attack us there? Is that what you're saying? Or, or what's the... Not, um, we would have focused on Al-Qaeda in different areas. Um, for example, a heavier footprint in Afghanistan or focusing right. in on um, areas of or Somalia. Right. Well, we did look at we did look at the heavier footprint in Afghanistan, but the one that we didn't look at was what if we had pursued Al Qaeda to other ungoverned areas? And the answer, the the short answer is, they didn't go to other un other, other ungoverned areas until after Iraq. Right. They went they they went first to the Fatah, and then focused their attention. That was in Pakistan. They went across the border into Pakistan, uh, and then to Iraq. And then as that as Iraq uh, played out, they uh, broadened their um, allegiance with Yemen and, and uh, uh, Somalia and also um, the Maghreb. Now, to me, the, where I thought you were going to go is what if we pursued them inside Pakistan? That's an interesting counterfactual. So what if we had kept going uh, and pursued them into Pakistan? That's a very thorny... Uh, I know why we didn't. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. What would have happened if we had done it? Could Pakistan have maintained its integrity as a army that owns a state if the U.S. has invaded its, uh, its sovereign territory and, it, and the army is not fighting back? I don't know. In, and an invasion of Pakistan is, in several orders of magnitude, more difficult military problem for the U.S., more difficult even than the invasion of Iraq. And so I think the, the consequences of that might have been quite daunting for the U.S. Uh, military. Well, we've done that, Peter, right? Well, no, we've done it with drone strikes. We haven't done it with uh, what I thought, what I took to be the counterfactual, which is, you know, the way we did Iraq, you know, with armored columns. Um, I think that would have been actually 
too hard. Okay, all right, well, please join me in thanking Peter for a